Hi guys, so today's video is not gonna be like my normal vlog style video. I've been noticing that my views are going down, so I'm doing a test related video. Also, I was looking through all my comments on the SAT video and a lot of them were asking me like, oh my God, how'd you get that score? What'd you do to prepare for it? Any tips or advice, like that kind of stuff. So I thought I'd make a video about that. I'm just gonna jump right into it. There's not really a lot of intro for this video. I, ha I have my computer here, which has like, notes and stuff so I know I'm saying everything. But first I want to address why I said 1450 plus in the title. First of all, it's the score that most close to what I got basically. Um, when I took the test, when I took the test in the test SAT score revealing video, I got a 1410. Um, I got a higher score when I retook it, I got a 1440 and when you super scored it, it was a 1460. Um, so that makes me feel like I'm qualified to say what a 14, <laughs> that you can get a 1450 plus because uh, I got pretty much that score so and second of all most like competitive elite colleges that's a pretty competitive score obviously there's gonna be some schools like the ivies or stuff where it's like a little higher but i think that's a good benchmark score to go for and if you're really trying to go to like a really good top 30 top 40 school if you want to know like what a good score for a certain school is like if you have a specific school in mind and you want to know what a good score would be um, i suggest looking up either a class profile for the school so just search like blah blah school class profile, preferably 2022, because that's the most recent class. Or if you can't find that, the common data set for a school, just search blah blah school common data set and it should pop up on Google. Uh, most, pretty much every school should have one or the other. So there you'll get, use this statistic that's really helpful. It's called the middle 50% range of scores, which as an example, like I can pull up Purdue's right now, which is a school I go to. Um, and yeah, it says, so 1190 to 1390 is the middle 50% means 25% of those kids who got in scored above 1390. 25% of those kids scored below 1190 and still got in, so that's kind of what you can look for. They also have ACT there too, if you're looking at that test. But this video is going to be mostly on the SAT because that's the one I took. I never took the ACT, unfortunately. I guess let's just jump right into it. So the good thing is I truly believe the SAT or standardized tests in general are one of the most easily improvable statistics on your college application. Because it's both the ACT and the SAT, they're just tests that test you on things you already know, but they just ask it in weird ways. That's sort of the gist of what they do. So the math section of the SAT, they're not going to ask you about calculus or like even pre-calc because the test is designed for high school juniors and not all high school juniors have learned those advanced math, more advanced math topics. So they ask you, so like for math as an example, it would be algebra, algebra 2, geometry, and trig. So like shoot that's a bad angle the way you get better is just by being familiar with the test so basically the more you take it the more you practice the more you'll understand how they ask the questions how they present information and your score will inevitably go up like literally if you just keep on working at it the sky's the limit you can just get whatever score you want for example there's this part I know of a person who got a 1300 or was consistently getting 1300s um, on their SAT so they decided to study for two hours a day for like a couple months before they took their actual SAT exam. And then they got a 1500 and now they're going to Stanford. So even if you're just getting very low scores, you can still put in the effort. And with these few tips, I think you can get there. One of the first things you should do if you just are watching this video and you haven't done any prep at all is just take a diagnostic test or two. Uh, one should be fine, but if you want to take a second one, that's fine. I heard this tip from Study to Success. She sort of explained it well. I'll link her video below. But she basically said that do you take a diagnostic test just so you can see what your strengths are. And if you ever don't know the answer to something, circle it. Or if you guess on an answer, circle it. Just Or make a different mark, maybe like a star or something. I don't fucking, and what, you can mark whatever you want, I don't care. Mark your mistakes, mark the ones you guess, and then score yourself. If you want to know where you can find like practice exams, you can find free ones on the College Board website or Khan Academy is what I use and that's literally the best thing ever. Um, it's free and like they'll tailor different questions and like passages or math problems or whatever based on whatever you are struggling with. Um, I sound like I'm being sponsored by Khan Academy but I have like two subscribers. They're, trust me, they're not sponsoring me. <laughs> so yeah, that's the one of the best things I use. You could also get prep books. So like Princeton Review I hear is really good. And the College Board official one obviously because that'll be questions that they, there'll be tests that they may have given out in the actual book. And there's tests that are very closely modeled to the actual test and they're made by the people who actually create the SAT. So even online there's a couple on the College Board website so you can just use those. Um, I suggest printing them out too because then it'll be more closely mimicking like the actual test. I know this is really helpful for like reading where you can annotate instead of having to look at a screen. So just take a couple of those tests, see where you are and then you know what sort of sections to focus on. And yeah, I'll go back more into when you're taking tests, how to like analyze your mistakes and stuff. 
but for now I'll just talk about the individual sections and my advice for each section um, because this video is going to be hella long. So. so the first section is the reading section. The reading test will always have like the same types of passages. There will always be an English one, which I think is always first for some reason, I don't know. Like a science-y kind of one with graphs and stuff. A history passage, economics, kind of like society one, society related passage. Just like a basic, just like reading an article or something. So those kind of like readings, that made no sense, but. And then there's usually like some fifth one that's kind of like also in that same ballpark, but it could be anything, I think. Don't take my word on that. But I know English history and science will always be on there, so if you're ever struggling with like a type of passage and you're like, oh, it might not be on the test, yes it will, one of those three definitely will be on the test, and if you're not doing well on them, then you should study for it because you're just going to keep failing it. Sorry, that was kind of harsh. <laughs> so that's just the whole breakdown of the whole section, and one of the first tips I say is when you're, this is my first actual tip, oh my god, when you're taking the reading section, the first thing is you should not do what they want you to do. Um, that sounds weird, but what they want you to do is read the whole section or whatever and then answer the questions afterward. The problem with this is that, first of all, you could, when you're answering your questions, you could forget information that you read. You could have not paid attention to the information the question is asking for. Some of the questions ask you to go back into the passage to look for stuff, like there'll be the questions where like, oh, the word in line 67 or something most nearly means blank, blank, and blank, and then it'll make you like go back. You have to look at line 67. or the even more annoying questions where it's like gives you a claim and then it says this claim is most supported by this evidence this evidence this evidence and you have to keep going back so if you've taken the test you know exactly what i mean and that means you basically read it and you have to go back and read it again which wastes time my advice is there's two methods i learned to do the reading section the first one is to the skimming method where you just skim the passage like read it in two three minutes max like no more than that and then you start answering the questions and you can go back in depth and you'll know where to find the information because you just read the passage, like skimmed it before. So you'll know generally where you can find the information you're looking for. The other, more savage method in my opinion, which is the one I did, because I'm a savage, is just the question first method where you don't read the passage at all. Um, skip the main idea question where it'll be like, the main idea of this passage is the, and then answer that one last. So then you go to the next question and because all the questions are in order, which is very important. You just look at the first question and you can start reading that and know exactly what you have to look for. Go to the next question and then keep reading. Go to the next question, keep reading, blah, 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 blah. Basically meaning you have the information you're already looking for so your mind will be scanning for that information while you read. And that saves a lot of time. And then by the time you're done with all that, you can go back to the main idea question, know what the passage is about because you've read it while answering the questions and get it right. I found that works especially with like the sciencey ones because those are a little less technical and there's not as many like metaphors. And yeah, those are the main kind of tips I have for that section. Um, the other thing I have to say is that they have to make the test as clear and concise as possible. So when they give four answer choices, there has to be one answer that's just way more right and like unarguably more right than the others because if you have two similar sounding answers and both could arguably be correct like the whole country would throw a hissy fit at college board and they would be that's their worst nightmare basically if you see two answers that are very similar um the answer key do not pick them those are both not right that usually doesn't happen though just remember that there's always gonna be one that's like unequivocally right and more right than others and it will just like stand out for the rest of them you have to look for it as you're taking the test but that's mostly it for the reading section um the other thing that i heard of like the strategy was just when you take your test and you like circle and answer wrong answers analyze why you got them wrong and don't just be like oh i guessed wrong just keep asking yourself why i think it was like three or four whys is what you should do so like next section so the grammar section this one i don't have a lot of advice for because I hate to say that it's like common sense because for some of you, you might be really struggling with it. If English is especially your first language, this should be easier just if you speak it out. Not Obviously don't speak it out loud, but like speak it in your head and if it sounds right, it should probably be right. Um, remember the rules where I versus me, my friend and I did this, just get rid of the my friend and uh, isolate the I. And if it sounds right, I did this, then you know it's correct. I did something, me don't do anything. I hope you guys know that rule. So there's this one YouTube common example I remember where it was like this person almost killed my friend and I. That is technically not correct. Uh, that is not correct. Because if you get rid of the my friend and, the person almost killed I. That's not correct. So, boom. 
One thing I, I know not to do is a lot of times they may recommend you do like vocab cards so you can understand more vocab. I found that that doesn't help at all and I feel like it's just a waste of time because it's hard to predict what words are going to be on the actual test. Like, there's so many words on the English language you don't know that facetious is going to be on there. So like why are you going to practice trying to memorize it when you could be actually taking the test and familiarizing yourself with the structure of it which is going to be way more productive. And then there's obviously going to be those questions where they ask about like paragraph structure. And in that case, just really read the passage, understand what the argument is about. And then when it asks you to rearrange something, know what the thesis is and whether the argument progresses and where that sentence should fit. That, I'm, this is really vague advice and I'm really sorry. I don't know exactly how to help with the grammar section. I feel like it's probably one of the easiest sections on the test. So as long as you just don't overthink your answers and if it sounds right, it should be right, you should be just fine. And just follow the other steps where if you keep seeing yourself making the same mistake, just keep practicing that, etc., etc. Now for the math section, which was probably my favorite section and the one I scored highest in, um, in both of the tests. My hair is looking great right now. The first thing I have written is check over your answers as you go through the test. I obviously don't spend a ton of time, but I found doing this versus waiting till the end and like trying to go through all of them, just keep checking over your answers as you go. And if you start seeing like you're running out of time, don't do that, obviously. You gotta finish the test, but... <laughs> Because that's the first key to getting a good score is actually answering every question. But I found that to be way better, just to be able to briefly go over through my problem solving process again and just get it done. Um, if you're stuck on answer, skip it after 30 seconds. Um, that's true for any question on the test, not just the math section. Don't waste time on a question you don't know how to answer. If you don't know how to do a question before you skip it, try plugging the answers back into the problem. Sometimes back solving is a really easy way to do a problem, especially if it looks convoluted. So. That's a good tip for any test, not just the SAT, but it really helps you. Like I said again, it doesn't go up to calc, it doesn't go up to any of the really advanced math topics, it's just junior year, sophomore year, freshman year, and below. Like just all that basic math stuff. You should know how to do it, and they know you should know how to do it, they just ask you in weird ways, so really pay attention to the question. Really practice doing the tests over and over again, like with these practice, practice questions, because then you'll familiarize yourself with how they'd like to trick you. Remember cross multiplication. I forgot how to do that. I'm gonna not lie on many practice tests and actually probably one of the actual tests I took. And it saves a lot of time if you remember when you're trying to isolate X by itself and it's on the bottom, cross multiply. Remember that. The last thing I have is pay attention to what specific variable corresponds to the problem. Pay extra attention. If I ever got like many wrong answers, it was just because of that. I misinterpreted what a variable stood for. And there's a specific question I remember that traumatized me on a no calculator section where series of equations so it gives you two equations and you try to solve a variable between the two of them you've probably done that before and it was asking about like vegetables and like the weights of vegetables versus cost of the vegetables i mixed up the weight and the cost and it's like a weird thing because you'd always assume the cost made, remains constant and like when they're asking these questions where they'll be like oh oranges are six dollars a pound they're not but whatever and watermelons are ten dollars a pound so i always assumed that oh the six and the ten are just the six and the ten are the cost and the variable is the weight. And I was completely wrong and that was actually the weight and the cost was the variable so. Which is really strange to me but just like that's a perfect example of how the SAT can totally trick you and it questions what you normally see in math problems. Or there's another famous one where they do this, the circle and a square question where they give you like a box and inside there's like these kind of triangles but with rounded bottoms. I can try to insert a picture of it before and they ask you to find the area of all the triangles. And at first you're like, what, how do I do that? They're triangles, but they have the curved bottom. So like, what do I do? But then you have to realize when you look back, it's just, it's a square and a circle in the square. So you just take the area of the square and subtract the circle. It'll do things like that where it really, I know they're an educational institution and they're like, they're making these tests. And of course they want you to do well in the tests, but no, they're making these tests and they want you to fail because they want to weed out as many people as possible. <laughs> Obviously, if everyone got regular trig, geometry, algebra tests, they'd probably do really well and there'd be multiple people. Millions of people getting a hundreds, which is not what the SAT wants because millions of people applying to the same elite colleges with the top score doesn't help the colleges. So of course they're gonna make them harder, weirder, just to mess you up. So yeah, that's my rant about the math section. General advice, accept and realize that it'll take work. Um, like if you're sitting here right now, and you're like, wow, like these steps sound really helpful. Oh, I feel like I can ace this test and then you take it and then you get like a hundred points lower than what you thought you could get. And then you keep taking it and you're like, damn, this is harder than I thought. And you just feel lose motivation because it's not proving. Realize right now that it is going to take a lot of work. Just because you think you know how to do geometry doesn't mean you know how to take the SAT. Just because you're a pro at English doesn't mean you're going to get an 800 on the English section. Like I said, all high schoolers are taking these tests and 
it doesn't matter how well you do, they compare you to the rest of the people who take the test. So realize that in order to get a 1450, that means beating out 98% of other people who take the test. So that's going to take a lot of work if you've never taken the test before, because you're competing against all these people who've gotten tutoring, practice their minds off. And I'd suggest like if you're watching this video and just after it's uploaded and you're taking the SAT in March, just do half an hour a day. I think is an easy way to start. Half an hour to an hour is I think a good, there's something in my teeth, like benchmark, just practice every day. If you're worried you're not going to have time to do it, and you're like me, where if you were procrastinating and running out of time, you'd always push that stuff aside just to get your homework done. And like, I work well under pressure, so pretty much every time I procrastinate, I always got the work done. I found if I were to do practice like at the beginning of my day, before I start all my homework, I will inevitably get all my homework done because I always got my homework done, no matter how little time I had. So just squeeze it in there at the beginning before you do your homework, get it done. Also, I feel like tutoring is overrated. It's expensive. Um, they can be hundreds of dollars to, I feel like that's kind of a waste of money. And even though I did it, I, I took Khan Academy, got a $1,400 practice test, afterwards did tutoring for like a straight month, month and a half, and I got a 1410. So that raised my score by 10 points. It did do me hundreds of dollars, 10 points. I feel Khan Academy working on your own pace is really the way to go. If there's like cheap practice tests, I know public schools, like my public school, or not my brother, my public school, but my brother's school, lucky. But he got, he just had to pay $20 and he got weekly classes for the entire first semester of high school, of his junior year. So if you have opportunities like that, of course, take advantage of that because then it forces you to actually practice. But I feel like one-on-one -on -one tutoring is a little overrated. And if you're still messing up and not improving, like you're doing all these steps and you're like not improving whatsoever, then at that point, you should realize it's probably a content related problem. Doesn't mean you can't get higher on the test just because you keep taking and you keep getting the same score, but actually look at the content and like realize, oh, Maybe you do need to review alternate interior angles and stuff like that from geometry sophomore year, even though you thought you were a pro at math. But a lot of us who are taking these tests may have not done that stuff in years. I forgot how to do percent difference when I was doing tutoring, and my tutor made fun of me for it, so. <laughs> um, but I still got a 790 in math, so you too. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Basically, it's don't be ashamed if you don't know how to do it, and don't be overconfident thinking that you know everything you knew from the three years of math that are on the test. Don't be overconfident and think you know it just because you're in a higher math class. Don't be afraid to be like, crap, I need to review how to do subtraction. Um, that would be really bad, but <laughs> just practice it. You know what? No one's judging. <laughs> I'm not judging. You're gonna get the last laugh when you get a better score than the people who ignore that. That's about all I have to say for this video. Um, I know it's kind of long. If you have any other questions that I didn't address or any other specifics about my testing experience or anything, just leave them down in the comments below. I'll be responding to them. I love reading your comments. I linked my social media in the comments below, so if you have any questions want to ask me on there, that's fine too. Yeah, I'll see you guys in the next video. Um, if you want me to do another kind of advice video, like for AP tests and stuff, I guess I could do that too. But yeah, I'm gonna try to upload more in 2019 because that's one of my New Year's resolutions is to be more active on YouTube. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Comment down below anything you want and like this video, subscribe for more content and fun stuff about college and advice and call it yeah college application advice oh my god i learned so much and i could totally teach you guys to learn from my mistakes because i made a lot of them i can help you not do the same thing cool cool all right thanks for watching bye why did my camera just like weird out like that Cool, bye.